Hi there, this is Dr. Rob, Dr. Rob Sivas, the Carb Addiction Doc. This is my first podcast in this series on YouTube, so let's start at the fundamental beginning. Let's start with human biology and human evolution. I'm going to summarize a few things. Obviously, it's not a drill down for a few seconds, but follow the gist of the story because it's going to explain how we human beings function. We started out way, way back, over 100,000 years ago, as vegetarian primates. The closest example of that right now are gorillas. And under those conditions, we ate a lot of plants. The problem with eating plants is they're very, very low in nutritional yield. In other words, when you eat plants, you don't get a lot of nutrition per bite. And therefore, we have to eat for 14, 16 hours a day just to get enough in because of our size. Think about a gorilla. The other part about our prehistory is that our intestine was adapted to extract energy and calories and nutrients from those plants. Now, what's important is there's no mammal in existence. There is no mammal in existence who can consume vegetables and directly extract calories from them, particularly cellulose. And most of the energy, the sugar in vegetables is locked in this leafy green stuff called cellulose. But there is something inside of some animals that can extract that cellulose, and those are bacteria. So vegetarian animals either have a very large stomach, like a cow with four different chambers, stuffed chock-a-block full of these symbiotic bacteria that they have a relationship with, or, for example, in a gorilla, they have these massive colons, again, chock-a-block full of bacteria, and those Bacteria process the cellulose that these vegetarian animals eat and extract the sugar. But here's the key thing. There's no mammal out there that can live on sugar. If they eat sugar, they will become sick and die. So how is it possible that eating all the sugar in the form of cellulose because they're vegetarian and really vegan, apart from some snails and other slugs that they might eat in their vegetable food, how is it possible that they don't become diabetic, fat, and die? Here's why. Because the bacteria that they have that symbiotic relationship with converts the sugar that gets extracted from cellulose into fatty acids. Sure, there's a little bit of protein, but mostly it's fatty acids. About 70% of the calories that enters a cow or a gorilla's bloodstream is actually fatty acid. That's the energy. That's the fuel that they have in their fuel tank. And it's because of the bacteria and the relationship they have with that bacteria that they can convert those vegetables into useful energy and useful nutrients, either through their stomach or through their colon. Now, obviously, if you look at the, at the human intestinal tract, it doesn't look like that. We have a relatively small stomach, and we actually have a relatively small colon but we have a relatively massive, long, big, small intestine. So what has happened to us over the last 100,000 years? Well, the issue with being a gorilla, for example, if you're eating 16 hours a day, and then obviously you have to get rid of what you're eating, you're eating and pooping the whole darn day. Guess what? There ain't a lot of time to use your brain. So basically, gorillas feed, reproduce, and sleep. And yeah, they've got a couple of tricks to keep themselves away from being eaten by other animals, but they're not very smart. As human beings 100,000 years ago, or our predecessors really, started coming out of the jungles where we ate the leafy green vegetables, and we moved more to shorelines and more to savanna-type areas where we had access to water, we had access to seafood, and we had access to other animals. As we started to do that, we started to eat more and more animal products maybe some small things like snails and, and insects, and slowly, slightly bigger animals, other mammals. And over time, now these are thousands of years, our intestine adapted. Because we weren't eating so many leafy green vegetables, our stomach shrank, and the bacteria were no longer necessary to be in there to process the food. And we started developing enzymes, little proteins that break down complex chains of protein and fat when we eat that from animal sources. Remember, animal sources are rich in protein and fat, but really don't have any carbohydrates in them. 
So our intestine adapted to be able to utilize and extract nutrients from other animals. Well, the beauty about eating animals is that bang for buck, eating a steak, eating some meat, has a very, very high dense nutritional value relative to a massive amount of plants. So while the enzyme is our small intestine in particular, and from our pancreas and from our liver, adapted and became more robust and became uh, larger in volume, we were able to extract that energy very rapidly, very rapidly from the animal products we ate. So we became more and more omnivorous. What does that mean? Yeah, we can do fine with vegetables, but meat's where it's at. And we started eating meat and fish and birds, and <clears throat> we became dependent on those things. And here's one of the reasons why. Because when you eat animal products, you need very little in a very short period of time to give yourself massive, long-standing nutritional value. And then if you're eating for a short period of time per day, guess what that frees you up to do? It frees you up to use this thing. It frees you up to use the brain. So during that time, based on the transformation of our diet, at the same time, our brain was getting bigger and bigger and structurally better and more sophisticated in terms of what we were able to do. The very things I'm doing right now, I'm talking, I'm using my hands, I'm using my brain, I'm articulating abstract concepts. No other animal can do that effectively. And it's primarily based coexistently with the evolution in our diet. So the more meat-based our diet became, the more time we gave our brains to develop, the more time we would be able to become the apex of species that live on the, on the earth. And we became that dominant species on earth because of our brain and our intestinal tract allowed our brain to develop. So the greatest bang for your buck comes from animal products. But our, our evolution was even smarter than that. It said, okay, sometimes we can't get hold of these animals. Let's retain some extraction of nutrients and some extraction of energy from some of the starchy, animal, uh, starchy vegetables that we eat. What we lost, the price we paid, and this is critically important, human beings are no longer able to extract energy from cellulose. We cannot extract energy from plants. I'll say that again. We cannot extract energy from plants unless we highly, highly process those plants. But when we do extract the energy, it's sugar, and we no longer have the bacteria in our stomach or our colon to turn that sugar into fat before we absorb it. And therefore, we absorb sugar if we eat plants or if we eat starchy vegetables, which are your grains, which are your rices, your potatoes, your pumpkins. And what happens to that sugar, we're now not having bacteria in our intestine converting it to fatty acids for our energy. The liver, which is not designed to do this, now has to convert that sugar to fat. And while it can do it a little bit, that's part of the survival of our species, it's good at doing it a little bit. Maybe having a couple of apples just before winter fattens us up and we're willing to ignore the damage from that sugar to be able to fatten up. But in the modern era, when we have carbohydrates everywhere, our system isn't designed to process them. We are no longer cows or gorillas. So we absorb that sugar and it goes straight into our bloodstream. Well, that sugar in the bloodstream, we're not biologically attuned to handling it. So that sugar in our bloodstream causes damage. However, under a lot of pressure from a hormone called insulin, we take that sugar and we convert it to fat. And that's where this comes from. This comes primarily from the conversion of that excess sugar into fat. And the problem then happens that if you're doing that excessively, the liver starts being overwhelmed and it's unable to cope. And one of two things happens. Either in some people that sugar builds up in their bloodstream. And what, the, what are those diseases called? Those are the diabetogenic or diabetic diseases. Because when sugar builds up in your bloodstream, it damages blood vessels. And when blood vessels get damaged, your risk for a heart attack, your risk for a stroke, your risk for damage to all organs that are supplied by blood goes up. Now, some people are fortunate enough, enough that genetically they can produce huge amounts of insulin. So they can keep spanking their liver and spanking their liver to say, work, dude, work, dude. 
even though the liver is becoming resistant to that insulin, they can throw more insulin at that liver. And then the liver continues to produce fat. But the cost there is a very high insulin level. So they may not have high blood sugar. They become enormous. Those are obesogenic people. They become really huge. They become very fat. They may not have the measurable illnesses like a high A1C or a high blood sugar. But because their insulin level is extremely high, that insulin affects other systems in the human body. What does it do? In particular, high levels of insulin blocks the utilization of fat. It's silly to think that there's sugar in your bloodstream and now it's okay to have fat from your fat cells. So you've either got sugar or fat, insulin blocks the mobilization of fat. So you can't access this. You can't use your own fat. And then the second part is insulin blocks the conversion of cholesterol to steroid hormones. What does that mean? Majority of steroid hormones, your testosterone, your estrogen, your cortisol, your human growth hormone, your thyroid hormones, your cholecalciferol, which is critically important. It's actually called vitamin D3. Your absorption of the fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, K, are dependent on cholesterol being converted to those downstream uh, steroid hormones. So they start out as cholesterol with a few enzyme changes. They become estrogen. Why is that important? Because if you're a high insulin producer, if your insulin is very high, insulin blocks the first enzyme that changes cholesterol to those steroid hormones. So now you've got low estrogen, low testosterone, low cortisol, low human growth hormone, um, low thyroid. You don't have vitamins A, D, E, K, and you've got low vitamin D. And you've got diseases related to all of those. What diseases do we have? We have polycystic ovarian syndrome. We have the diseases of low testosterone, which means that fat is now accumulating around your organs. And that's part of that disease process called metabolic syndrome. We have low cortisol and low thyroid levels. Low thyroid levels are associated with just feeling flat, a low metabolic rate, low energy. And human growth hormone, your tissue repair, your cancer surveillance goes out the window. So inflammation becomes a problem. Cancer becomes a problem. So you see how chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption by human beings affects the entire system. The human intestinal tract is not designed to consume sugar or designed to consume vegetables in large quantities. A small amount of vegetables, yeah, they can extract the nutrients that are associated with them. But the sugar overwhelms the system and causes damage. So once you understand human biology, you can understand that we really need to be primarily an animal product based diet with maybe some vegetables should we choose to be. This move back to a plant based diet is an evolutionary move backwards towards where we came from. And it just doesn't make biological sense. I don't want to talk about um, the emotional parts about not eating plants or not eating animals, purely from a biologic human evolution perspective. Being a pure plant-based eater doesn't make evolutionary or biologic sense. Being more animal-based makes all the sense in the world. And the more we can migrate to, toward that, the healthier we become, the healthier we are, the better our brains function. I hope you enjoyed that podcast. If you did, please click the subscribe button and become a subscriber to my YouTube channel. And if that message resonated with you and made you think, and you made a decision to do more to help yourself, but you need help, please come and see us. Set up a consultation. We can do it in person in my offices in Palm Beach Gardens at 561-627-4107 or in Jacksonville, Florida at 904-410-3934. I also do some long distance consults telephonically or on Zoom. Set that up as well by calling 561-627-4107. We help people to manage their diabetes better and also to get started in obesity management. Or if you've had bariatric or obesity surgery and are struggling, give us a shout. We can help to get you back on track.